Hi guys, Harry here. Welcome to Scrap Science. This video will likely be my last video, at least for a while, on the topic of the chloralkali process. Today, what we need to do is generate some potassium hydroxide because I need some for a future project. This is going to be very similar to what we did in our previous video on making sodium hydroxide from sodium chloride by the chloralkali process. In fact, we're going to be using the exact same cell that we used last time uh, in order to generate our potassium hydroxide. Uh, we're going to be using the same electrodes and everything. So the setup at least will be pretty much exactly the same as it was in that video. Before we go ahead and put the cell together though for making our potassium hydroxide, uh, there's one test that I want to do, uh, namely in comparing uh, the efficiencies of making sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide by this process. So straight away, let's just magically skip forward and talk about that experiment. So yes, here we are doing some testing for our potassium hydroxide electrolysis process. What I really wanted to do here was uh, test the efficiency of uh, the potassium hydroxide chloralkali diaphragm cell electrolysis versus the same process involving um, sodium hydroxide. You can see we're doing exactly the same thing as we were doing in our previous um, chloralkali testing video where we use our standardized diaphragm electrolysis cell. We fill the anode chamber with a solution containing either sodium or potassium salt. Uh, in this case, what I'm doing right now is the potassium run. And then we electrolyze with carbon electrodes and form uh, the corresponding hydroxide in the cathode chamber. I've gone over how this works many times and I won't bore you with explaining it again. We run the cell for 48 hours each. Uh, we measure the amount of charge that we've put through the cell and we take samples out of the cathode chamber at regular intervals. And eventually we will get a graph of the concentration of our hydroxide that we form versus the amount of charge that we've put through the cell. And in comparing our sodium and potassium runs, uh, we will be able to compare their efficiencies, their current efficiencies, that is not their overall energy efficiencies. Anyway, the reason that I'm going to the effort of comparing the efficiencies um, regarding the sodium ion and potassium ion processes separately is because the potassium ion process should be slightly more efficient than the sodium ion counterpart. My reasoning behind the potassium ion process being slightly more efficient comes from the fact that in aqueous solution, potassium ions are slightly more mobile than sodium ions by a factor of about 50%. What that means is, as we run the cell and generate a little bit of um, alkali hydroxide in the cathode chamber on the right, the current that we put through the cell, and we're talking about any cell here, whether it be sodium or potassium, um, has two ways in order to get that charge transfer going. First of all, we can have the alkali ions, so the sodium or the potassium ions, flow that way towards the cathode through the cell. That's one of the forms of charge transfer that we can get between the two half cells. Or hydroxide ions from the cathode chamber can flow towards the anode, and that will achieve the same effect of charge transfer, uh, allowing for completing the circuit and current flowing. Now the current efficiency of a cell like this is primarily dependent on how much of the current we can attribute to the alkali ions going that way rather than the useless process of the hydroxide ions going uh, to the left. Now that ratio between how many alkali ions we can get going that way versus the number of hydroxide ions we can get going that way is going to depend on the aqueous ionic mobility of the alkali ions versus the ionic mobility of the hydroxide ions. If we have a more mobile uh, alkali ion, there's going to be a greater proportion of the current going towards pushing our alkali ions towards the cathode chamber, that being the process that we actually want to occur in the cell. And if we have a less mobile alkali ion, then we are going to see an even greater proportion of the current going towards our inefficiency, that being the movement of our hydroxide ions. Anyway, basically a more mobile uh, cation, that being potassium rather than sodium, allows for more of our current to actually go towards our effective process that we actually want to occur in forming our hydroxide in the cathode chamber. From what I can remember of the numbers, uh, hydroxide ions are about four times more mobile than sodium ions, so the efficiency already isn't great there. Uh, but with the potassium ion process, 
hydroxide ions are only about 2.7 times more mobile than potassium ions. So we have quite a big difference there and hopefully uh, that'll translate into a non-negligible difference between our efficiency measurements. But either way, I'm just about to finish up with this cell. Uh, I need to do a few titrations of the samples that we've collected previously uh, in order to make our graph of charge versus concentration of our potassium hydroxide and then we will have some graphs to compare. So we'll just skip right forward to then, I suppose. And here is the data we obtain from comparing the sodium and potassium processes for the chloralkali cell. As you can see, we can clearly observe the effect that we were looking for in that the potassium process is more efficient than the sodium process. In fact, it's far more pronounced than I was expecting. Um, I was only really expecting a few percent maybe 5% at most difference between the two runs. And I was kind of worried that we wouldn't actually be able to see it at all with our simple cell setup. But there it is. If we put the same amount of charge through a sodium and a potassium cell, uh, we will generate a more concentrated potassium hydroxide solution than we will generate a sodium hydroxide solution. So the process is more efficient uh, when we run it with potassium, as we were expecting. The data doesn't really get much clearer than this. Anyway, we will move on to putting together our chloralkali cell so that we can actually generate some large quantities of potassium hydroxide solution. Alrighty, we are back to our actual potassium hydroxide chloralkali cell. Um, you know the drill. Basically, we have some potassium chloride here that I bought online. This is normally used as a salt substitute for people who need a low sodium diet. I'm not really sure, uh, but we're going to be using it today to make our potassium hydroxide. What we're going to do is just put a solution of potassium chloride into uh, what's going to be the anode chamber of our chloralkali cell. Uh, we have a clay pot diaphragm in between our two separate chambers here. And if we electrolyze, this being the cathode, this being the anode, uh, we will drag potassium ions across from the anode compartment over to the cathode compartment and those potassium ions will react on the cathode to form a pure solution of potassium hydroxide. Again, it's exactly the same as what we did for our sodium hydroxide video. The only difference being that it will be slightly more efficient as we covered just a minute ago. All right, everything's wired up. Only thing left to do is add our catholite, which is initially just distilled water and then our analyte which is a saturated solution of potassium chloride with a bunch of excess salt in there as well. You'll notice that I also have a beaker with a little bit of sodium hydroxide solution in it. That will catch all of the chlorine that comes off the anode. See, so we're collecting it in that inverted funnel and then through that tubing into our gas scrubber. We put a small piece of cling wrap over the cathode chamber there making sure not to make it completely airtight because we need hydrogen to escape, but this will stop carbon dioxide from getting in and reacting with our potassium hydroxide as we form it. It'll also stop any dust or insects from getting in too. And with that, we're ready to turn everything on. So let's go. You can see initially we get zero current. That's due to the fact that as always, uh, our distilled water isn't a very good conductor, but as soon as we get some ions going across, uh, we will start to see that current rise. And that's that. We can leave this going uh, for, I'm planning to leave it going for around 72 hours. I'm hoping to get around about maybe 30 or 35 grams of uh, potassium hydroxide in our cathode chamber. Eventually when the current builds up, I'll be running the cell at approximately 1.5 amps, I'm hoping. With the low efficiency that this cell uh, achieves, around about 15 to 20%, that should generate 30 grams of potassium hydroxide, no worries. But yeah, that's that. Uh, this current is gonna take quite a while to build up, I'd imagine. So we'll just skip ahead to when the reaction looks uh, a bit more vigorous and we can actually see some stuff going on. Oh yeah, one last thing to mention before we skip forward is that we need to constantly, or not constantly, but as often as possible, stir the analyte. That'll just make sure um, that the anode is always in contact with our saturated potassium chloride solution. Of course, that's only a problem once the cell actually gets up and running. Now, it has been 20 hours since we started running the cell, and in that time, overnight, 
uh, the current at 12 volts that is has built up to around 1.15 amps and through the rest of the day I expect that to raise even further to our desired 1.5 amps uh, but we're at the stage now where we can actually start to see stuff happening not that there's much to talk about um, we went over most of the chemistry of this process in our previous video basically we'll just see if we can get a good look at the chlorine and hydrogen being generated on the electrodes And there we have it. This is what I think will be the end of the run of the cell. We'll start packing it up now. Um, I've had it running for about four days um, at around about 1.2 amps on average over all that time. During the day I keep it on uh, 1.5 amps and then overnight when I can't watch it I leave it running at a bit less than an amp. In that time we theoretically generated uh, 150 to 200 grams of potassium hydroxide and at the efficiency that this cell is probably running at around about 15 percent probably uh, that's around 30 grams at best uh, that we're going to get out of this cell but that's all i need so uh, time to take it all apart and extract our yield and there everything's packed up uh, you can see our cathode did perfectly fine as it always does nothing's going wrong there that's um, in a reducing environment and the copper wire hasn't degraded at all uh, the anode looks a bit dodgy because it's still covered in a whole bunch of potassium chloride crystals but that is doing perfectly fine we didn't see any rise in voltage for the cell over the course of the four days so we can tell that our MMO mesh is doing perfectly fine there um, where we connected to the titanium with our alligator clip you can see the alligator clip rusted quite considerably but that's to be expected we are working with chlorine compounds and everything chlorine gas even a little bit would have escaped the cell and rusted that away so that's fine uh, our gas collector got covered in a whole bunch of potassium chloride crystals and our tubing here has gone all white um, due to the chlorine that's been flowing through it but it didn't uh, break at any point so that's good the gas scrubber itself uh, is a kind of yellowy green at this stage and that's because uh, as the chlorine reacts with the sodium hydroxide in solution there it forms sodium hypochlorite or bleach uh, which is this quite nice yellow color there uh, we've actually made some quite concentrated bleach there which might be useful in the future and then to the solution that was in our anode compartment you can see this is slightly yellow because it does contain some um, sodium hypochlorite same as our gas scrubber um, this will be contaminated with as I said hypochlorite and chlorate but otherwise it's pretty much just a solution of uh, potassium chloride along with a bunch of very light white suspension in there which is probably uh, a result of impurities in the original uh, potassium chloride finally we have our yield of potassium hydroxide solution which I will right now go ahead and titrate to find out how much we have we have 600 milliliters of solution here and I'm expecting around 25 grams of potassium hydroxide to be in here it's also a very nice and clear solution if I didn't mention that which is a good sign that um, the diaphragm our clay pot diaphragm that we used which also held up incredibly well I might add uh, didn't leak at all as it turns out uh, in our solution of 600 milliliters here there is close to 50 or 60 grams worth of potassium hydroxide there which is crazy I had to double check my um, titration I did a second and a third one uh, to check that the results were correct but yep around about 55 grams worth of potassium hydroxide are in solution here which is yeah a lot more than I was expecting especially considering uh, we've done this uh, process for sodium hydroxide before uh, where the efficiency was around 15 percent and in this case the the efficiency was around 25 to 30 percent which like I know we just did an experiment uh, showing that 
the efficiency of the potassium hydroxide process is way better than the sodium hydroxide process but I wasn't expecting a change that big for our chloralkali cell but I can't complain uh, a better yield than we expected is always a good thing uh, the only thing left to do is store our potassium hydroxide in a sealed container until we need it and well I'm happy with that um, I could boil it down a little bit to reduce the volume somewhat but whatever I can do that later and that's it potassium hydroxide solution made by our chloralkali cell see you later